That is how we're saved. We're not saved by doing righteous things. But nevertheless, God would often say to those in the Old Covenant, this is how you may delay this coming judgment. Verse 8, And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians. So Daniel is still, now 30 years later, still the chief of the magicians, which says something to us about how Daniel has gone about his duties for now for 30 years. He's gone about his duties as one who serves the king well. Just like Paul will say that whatever you do, do is unto the Lord. And Daniel has served the king of the kingdom of evil as though he's serving the Lord. Not obviously that that Daniel believes that Nebuchadnezzar is the Lord. Clearly in the story of Daniel, Daniel does not believe that. But he serves him well, as though he's serving the Lord. Also, this reminds us of chapter 1, verse 21, the end of chapter chapter 1, where we're told that Daniel will be in, in the place that God has put him until the first year of King Cyrus. So Daniel is going nowhere until God is done with Daniel. He's still now, 30 years later, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dreams that I saw and their interpretation. The vision of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the vision in my head as I lay in bed and behold, a watcher, a holy one. So that word watcher there literally means one who is awake. And it's Nebuchadnezzar doesn't use the word for angel here, but that's going to be what he's describing. He's describing this this watching angel sort of thing, which is what Scripture tells us oftentimes the role of angels is. So this watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from the man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watcher. So there's the second decree of the passage. Now the watcher decrees the decision by the word of the holy ones to the end that, and here we have a sentence that's going to show up three times. There's three sections in the chapter. At the end of each of those three sections, we find this sentence almost word for word, this same message given three times. Here's the point of the chapter. Here's the point of the whole book that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. We see that here. We're going to see it again in verse 25. We'll see the same thing virtually again in verse 32. Three times this same statement is repeated. And the statement is this. This is the point. This is the purpose that you may know that the Most High rules. And He doesn't just rule up above in heaven. He rules the kingdom of men. And He doesn't just rule the kingdom of men. He doesn't just direct those who are in charge. He puts people in charge. He sets over it whom he will. And he oftentimes, as is the way of God, doesn't set over the kingdom of men, the most powerful, the the most capable. He sets over it oftentimes the lowliest of men. Isn't that God's way? So this is the, the thrice repeated statement. The point of the whole book is the sovereignty of God over the nations. And in God's sovereign care, He allows His people to suffer and they have much more suffering to come, but God preserves them through it all because He is the ruler of the nations. That's the point of the book. That's the point of this chapter. That's the point of the vision. And three times we're told as much explicitly. Continuing on, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw. And you, O Belteshazzar, there it is again. And you, O Belteshazzar, 
Tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the Spirit of the holy gods is in you. So I beseech you, Daniel, O Belteshazzar, tell me what this dream means. Now, this doesn't mean that Nebuchadnezzar didn't have a clue. Neither does it mean that the dream interpreters didn't have a clue. I think that it's very clear that Nebuchadnezzar has a really good idea of what this dream means. The dream obviously is about him. The tree in the dream is about him. And I think that he knows that and something really bad happens to the tree. It gets cut down. And so I think Nebuchadnezzar has this sense of the basic underlying meaning of the dream, but he's consulting Daniel because he doesn't completely understand it or Maybe there's parts of it he doesn't understand and he hopes that Daniel is going to bring him some kind of encouraging message about the parts of it that he doesn't understand. That's probably why he consulted Daniel last because he was hoping his dream interpreters could give him a a little bit better spin on the dream maybe, but they were unable. (laughs) And so then as a last resort, he goes to Daniel, but he understands the basic meaning of the dream. The the parts of the dream he doesn't understand are not the problem. The problem are the parts that he does understand. And that is the way with God's Word, isn't it? Our problem with God's Word is not the parts we don't understand. Our problem with the Word of God is the parts that we do understand. Isn't it the way of sinful man? In our unwillingness to submit to God's Word, we point to obscure, difficult parts of Scripture as an excuse for not submitting to the parts that we do understand. Now, for sure, there are many parts of Scripture that we don't understand. We wrestle with those almost every week. But you know, the vast majority of Scripture is easy to understand. Our problem is not with the parts that we don't understand. Our problem is submitting to the parts that we do understand. In the same way, Nebuchadnezzar understands the basic meaning of the dream. This is a call for him to change his ways. This is a prophecy about what's going to happen to him if he doesn't repent and turn. And I think that he at least gets that basic message and he doesn't like it. That's why he's so disturbed about it. And that's why he's hoping that there's other other elements to the dream that will give him some kind of comfort or some sort of hope. But let's notice in the dream how it is that the dream shows Nebuchadnezzar how it is that he sees himself. So in the dream, Nebuchadnezzar is the tree. And in Scripture, a tree is a very common metaphor for a person or for a man, especially for a prideful man. We see a a similar type of thing, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 10, Ezekiel 31. We see other places where the same type of metaphor is used, the metaphor of a tree to represent a man, but not not just any man, but a prideful type of man. So in the dream, Nebuchadnezzar is the tree. And notice how he perceives the tree to be. This big tree reaches up to the heavens, is seen from the whole earth. So once again, that's his kingdom, this kingdom of evil, the kingdom of Babylon that was the golden head in chapter 2, now is the tree that reaches to the heavens and covers the earth in chapter 4. And this tree is said to be not only beautiful, the leaves are beautiful and its blossoms and beautiful and uh, fruit and everything and abundant, but also it is the great provider, the great protector. Notice how all the creatures of the earth are in its shade and, and all flesh was fed from it. This tree is the tree that's the benevolent provider for all the the creatures in the kingdom under the tree. And that's how Nebuchadnezzar sees himself. He sees himself as this benevolent type of provider and protector. And so he has a view of himself that stands in opposition of God's view of him. In verse 27, after Daniel interprets the dream for Nebuchadnezzar, he's going to apply it and he's going to say to him, break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed. So that's the real Nebuchadnezzar. The real Nebuchadnezzar is an oppressor. But Nebuchadnezzar sees himself as this provider, protector. You see, there is a disparity between how Nebuchadnezzar sees himself and how God sees Nebuchadnezzar. And the most difficult part of the dream for Nebuchadnezzar is going to be seeing himself as he really is, as God sees him. And none of us are able to do that without the Word of God. That is why we need the Word of God and the illumining work of the Spirit to show us ourself, because without that, we are blind to who we truly are. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't see himself rightly. 
He sees himself through a much kinder and better lens than he really was. And so often is the case with sinful man. Matthew chapter 7, remember this? When Jesus says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Cast out many demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. So you see, there's this great disparity between how these people see themselves. They see themselves as these mighty miracle workers for Jesus. But Jesus sees them differently as those whom he never knew. Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Here's what Paul means by seeing ourselves not too highly, not too lowly, but seeing ourselves with the measure of faith that's been given. Paul is saying, see yourself as God sees you through the eyes of faith. By faith, you understand yourself as Scripture teaches you about yourself. That's the eyes of faith. That's how we see ourselves by the measure of faith given us. And so how are we to see ourselves? If you are in Christ Jesus, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are to see yourself as both a hopeless, fallen sinner, incapable of pleasing God, while simultaneously absolutely covered by the righteousness of Christ. If you are in Christ, the Scriptures teach you that you are just as righteous as Jesus Christ because His righteousness completely covers you. But at the same time, We understand the hopeless condition of the sinner apart from Christ. That is seeing ourselves through the eyes of faith. So now verse 19, Daniel will interpret the dream. So then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, there it is again. Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while. So the understanding didn't immediately come to him. I think he probably had to take some time and pray over this. He was dismayed for a while and his thoughts alarmed him. So now the shock of the dream shifts from Nebuchadnezzar to Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar was shocked by the dream, troubled by the dream. Now Daniel, as he begins to perceive the dream, he is going to be alarmed by his thoughts. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream of the or, or the interpretation alarm you. So Nebuchadnezzar is now actually the comforter of Daniel. You see, there's a, there's a real warmth, isn't there, between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar? Neither one of them want the other one to be troubled and alarmed. Isn't that interesting? Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and the fruit abundant, in which was the food for all, under which the beast of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. That tree, O Nebuchadnezzar, it is You, don't you hear an echo there of Nathan the prophet declaring to David, that man who stole the sheep is you. Daniel Daniel here is following in the tradition of the prophets that are not slow to confront the leader, the king, the ruler. They're not slow to confront them with their own sin and their own need for repentance. Think of John the baptizer before Herod. Herod, the most powerful man in the land, John the baptizer standing before him and telling him it is not right for you to have your brother's wife. Or think of Moses to Pharaoh. Or think of Elijah to Ahab. Remember the Elijah story, how bold Elijah was to declare to the mighty powerful Ahab his own sin. Or Jesus to Pilate for that matter. Or Paul to Agrippa. All of them declared the message to the ruler of the land, and that message has always been basically the same. Your kingdom is passing away. Verse 22, It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. You hear here the echoes of the first dream, the statue with the golden head. The head of the statue was Nebuchadnezzar. The head of the statue was golden. And the head of the statue was the greatest, the most beautiful, the most valuable of the statue, indicating, of course, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the kingdom of evil. Babylon was the prototypical kingdom of evil and Nebuchadnezzar was its head. We see the same sort of echoes here. You have grown and become strong and and your greatness has grown and reached, reached to heaven. 
Now verse 23. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and its roots in the earth, bound with the band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven portions of time pass over it. This is the interpretation. O king, it is a decree of the Most High. So here's now the third decree. The first decree was Nebuchadnezzar's decree, which was to say, come and tell me the meaning of this dream. The second decree was the decree of the watcher, which was, which is to say, here is the point, the purpose that you may know that the most high rules. Now here's the third decree, the, the decree of the most high, which has come upon my Lord, the King, verse 25, that you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat the grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time shall pass over you. So seven periods of time is sort of left undefined there. Most people think that probably means years, but it could mean something else. It's left undefined for us. And you, the great tree that reaches to heaven and covers the earth, you will be driven from men. You will be wet with the dew of the field and you will eat grass like an ox till... We read again now the second time till you know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. But there's hope, says Daniel, verse 26, and it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree. Your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. So there is hope that is laid out. And that's why there's the iron and bronze band that's put around the stump to protect the stump as if to say this stump can be brought back to life under certain conditions, the conditions of turning, the conditions of repenting, the conditions of knowing that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will. So now, verse 24, Daniel says, Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed and that there may be perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. So Daniel's message to Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel's interpretation, Daniel's application to Nebuchadnezzar is there needs to be a change. This came to you, Nebuchadnezzar, because a change is needed in the way that you go about your life. You need to now pursue righteousness. You need to abandon these oppressive policies of yours. You need to change something about your life. Now, let's be very, very careful to understand what Daniel is saying to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel is not telling Nebuchadnezzar how it is that he might be made right with God. Daniel is not, to use another phrase, he's not giving Nebuchadnezzar a plan of salvation. Instead, what Daniel is saying to Nebuchadnezzar is, this is how you can avert for a time the coming judgment of God. That's how he says it at the very end, that perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. He's not saying to Nebuchadnezzar, this is how your sins may be forgiven and you may be made right with God by doing righteous things. This is not a way to be made right with God. This is a way that God is giving to Nebuchadnezzar, offering to Nebuchadnezzar that Nebuchadnezzar might delay for a time the coming judgment upon him. And this is so often the, the consistent message of the prophets, wasn't it? Jeremiah chapter 18, if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do it. God's not saying, well, this is how you're saved by turning from your evil because we're not saved by turning from evil. We're saved by believing and repenting. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. We're saved by His work on the cross and placing our trust completely in Him and repenting of our sins. That is how we're saved. We're not saved by doing righteous things. But nevertheless, God would often say to those in the Old Covenant, this is how you may delay this coming judgment. First Kings chapter 21, Elijah and Ahab. Have you seen how Ahab, this is God's, God talking to Elijah now. Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days. You see, we know we're not saved by works of the law. Galatians 2 and verse 16, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law but through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus' work of atonement on the cross in which He became my sin. And by faith, I become His righteousness. That's how we're saved. 
But yet God's message so often was there is judgment coming. But that judgment can be averted, at least for a time, by changing your evil ways. Now, why would God send that message to Nebuchadnezzar? Or for that matter, why would he send it to Ahab? Or why would he send it to any of the leaders that he sent it through his prophets in the Old Testament? The purpose, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2, was in order to bring about true and genuine repentance. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance of patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? There are Paul's words to the Romans in Romans chapter 2. So Paul says this is the purpose of God in his patient, forbearing, willingness to delay his wrath and judgment. His purpose is to lead you to repentance. And this is the purpose for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, if you change if you stop your oppressive ways, if you stop your unrighteous ways, then God will lengthen your time of prosperity in the hopes that repentance will come. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Truth That Transforms with pastor and Bible teacher Jason Wilkerson. Truth That Transforms is the daily teaching broadcast of Disciples Fellowship Church. We invite you to visit our website where you will find more resources to help in your journey of discipleship. You can find us at www.disciplesfellowshipnc.com or connect with our Facebook page at Facebook slash Disciples Fellowship NC. Truth That Transforms exists to glorify Jesus Christ through the teaching of His sanctifying and disciple-making Word.